do the sex. <laughs> Today's locker room talk and shots topic is what is Tantra, Tantric sex, and how can it improve your sex life? Story time. My first introduction to Tantra and Tantric sex was back in my college days. We're not going to talk about how long ago that was. And inevitably, some artsy, fartsy musician guy would approach me, tell me how he knew how to do Tantra and Tantric sex, how he could have sex for hours and hours, not come, but orgasm internally, and how he was going to give me lots and lots of orgasms. Now, I may have dabbled. I may have like bought into the sales pitch and tried it out. And I will say back then, the promise and the delivery did not match up. I do not think, I do not think they knew what they were talking about. But the good news is my guest today knows exactly what they were talking about. And she is going to tell us all about Tantra, Tantric sex, how we can start using it in our life. My guest today is Goddess Amina. She is a somatic sexologist, intimacy coach, and Reiki master. And she is the founder of Atlanta Tantra, a community rooted in somatic sexology and sacred sexual healing, and the host of Fix Your Sex podcast. She was also featured on the Netflix reality series, Sex, Love, and Goop. So this is the real shit, folks unlike my previous experiences. Uh, I mean, I would love for you to take a moment to introduce yourself to my listeners and tell them a little more. Yeah, of course. Thank you first for having me. And um, I've been in the sexuality field since the 90s. Um, and so I always like to start there, you know, late 90s. And then that out, but uh, I started off in the in the nineties as a surrogate partner, a sex surrogate, and I have been working and learning and studying and practicing, growing and evolving ever since. I went to massage school in the early two thousands and started practicing um, erotic and sensual or sexological body work, and that expanded and landed me into the world of tantra, where I have. Uh, learned and shifted and been just awakened to so much including um sex but also including my own body and my own just spiritual understanding and so that's been a beautiful awakening for me and I'm just excited to share some some real real life you know practical useful information on how we get into our bodies how we get to experience pleasure and how Tantra has helped me facilitate that in my life and in the lives of others. I'm currently my own best lover um, and I have a big self pleasure practice and I do think learning pleasure in your own body and sexuality in your own body and, and how that energy can affect everything else in your life and the people who are connected with you in their lives is such a powerful thing to do. So Listener, please stay to the end because we are going to really cover a lot here. And I'm going to make sure by the end of this podcast that we have given you some practical information that you can start using to improve your own uh, sex life or self-sex life uh, tonight or as soon as you've finished listening to this episode. So I'm really excited to have you here. I'm honored. I'm excited to, to learn all about Tantra. So let's get ready to talk about sex and Tantra. Cheers. So I'm like just going to start off with the obvious. What is what is Tantra? Um, that is like the biggest question, not just like the most popular, but actually the biggest <laughs> size wise right. question there. Um, there's a, first of all, I want to just acknowledge that there's different lineages of Tantra. Mm -hmm. And so you will hear Tantra spoken of in the Vedic sense, uh, which is coming through the subcontinent, coming through um, India and the region. You'll hear Tantra spoken about in the Buddhist context or Tibetan context, which is coming through Tibet and in the East. And then you'll hear Tantra spoken of in the Neo experience. So Neo Tantra, really focusing on almost isolated to California and Germany and throughout the UK, um, but very heavily prevalent 
in in kind of the west coast probably up through portland plenty and um and then through parts of europe as a kind of 70s um early to late 70s development and expansion of a westernized some may say bastardized uh version of tantra and uh, so you have these three kind of wide varieties that people could be speaking about at any time when they're talking about Tantra. When I started learning about Tantra, I learned through the lens of Neo-Tantra. I, I was living in Hawaii and back and forth between the Bay Area quite a bit. And so my exposure was through um, like Charles and Carolyn Muir and um, the folks up at Esalen and just kind of learning about Tantra through these, these West Coast Uh, communities and it was mostly centered around sex which is why I was excited and interested in it I was in my 20s um I had already been doing body work and so I was really into the body and the erotic and then I found this and I was like oh yeah sign me up and that is where we got started now neo tantra is the application of of things that you're seeing from Buddhist Tantra as well as Vedic Tantra kind of mushed up into a sandwich with modern like sexual spirituality. The word Tantra in its uh, origin is Sanskrit. It means weaving uh, or interwoven or connecting. It also can mean like tools. I like to look at it as a tool bag that we use to kind of connect our bodies to our everyday all the things that we do in life. Now, as a sexologist, I'm going to focus on that. But my Tantra practices now, as I've grown up a bit, really show up in every part of, of my life. Because at the end of the day, what we're really looking at when we look at Tantra is our ability to experience ourselves at our wholeness, our ability to be in our bodies and be in the present moment our ability to um, experience empathy as we were designed to and to experience pleasure and all of the other sensations that we get to experience as we were made to experience them. Um, there's a lot of nervous system understanding that pops up when you start really play, paying attention. There's a lot of uh, communication Uh, skills, uh, emotional agility that really show up in the practices of Tantra. And those translate very well to the bedroom, to sex coaching, to um, sexual experiencing. And so you see, as you pay more attention and learn about the different pathways, how it could all come together, uh, how the spiritual practices of the East could be so easily folded into erotic rituals that are new and created in the West. And I, I love that. And so that's my, my Tantra in a nutshell. It's just like, it's this mishmash, um, what we're seeing today, Neo-Tantra is a mishmash, but we, we cannot not acknowledge the lineages that the Tantra that we get in the West have borrowed from. Um, some might say stolen from, uh, and how that's created such a beautiful opening for us to kind of get into spiritual practices that actually provide immense pleasure and healing and connection. Can we talk a little bit about the practices and how they're applied to sex in the way that probably most people have heard of it? Absolutely. And I want to just say before I do that, like, let me just be clear mm -hmm. without like colonialism and all of the isms that we throw into things, Tantra included sex, oh, right? Okay. And spiritual practices all did, right? Like every, because how could you not? Like we are sexual beings. And so it's just like almost this extraction. Like we, we just left the rest of the stuff over there because That's what we do. We <laughs> over here. Like, we take the yummy one. stuff that we like, the things uh, that we're, and, yeah. and that are sometimes more marketable, and we throw the rest away. Exactly. It sounds to me very much in this conversation already. It it resonates uh, with yoga. Very similar. In fact, yoga is in the same lineage as, as tantra, 
And so when you study the Yamas and the Niyamas in both lineages, if you're in Vedic Tantra. So yeah, all of that. So I just want to leave with that. Like the body is yummy and it's always been there and pleasure has always been accessible. And spirituality has often um, said like, be really good at sex too, because this is a little taste of your heaven on earth. Go ahead. I want to put a microphone to what you said before, because I think especially... Um, certainly in Western civilization, this has been, I feel stolen from us. You said that we are all sexual beings and it's part of our sp spirituality. And I just really want people to have heard that. The way I was born into this world, and a lot of people, um, was to instantly have my sexuality taken from me and shamed and you only get to use it when you're doing this thing and you have to do it in this way only and if you explore and it looks different than this like like pull up your dress, pull down your underwear and, and get pounded at to make babies, then you're being dirty if you want something more than that. That is how most of us are literally like raised and 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 programmed and yeah. then we spend the yeah, rest exactly. of our life trying to unprogram that and you have yeah. just said what I think people just have to understand is that we are all like our sexuality and sexual energy is like our birthright it's part of us it's such a part of us and um uh, you know if you ever watch ultrasounds of babies or video you can you can, you can youtube it the babies actually masturbate in utero because it feels good and that's and the, one of the first accesses that we have as a human form is the access the sense of touch and so um like pleasure is our birthright having access to that is our birthright and also like as humans you have this beautiful reality of like how we come to be which is through this ple what could be a most pleasure filled you know hour or 15 minutes, whatever you're at, uh, of your of your day of your life, um, where you are in full connection and contact with another human being and boom, you create life. And that's how we're here. Like we're literally here because of this thing that feels so good when we let it. And then we're like, ooh, don't talk about it. And so one of the things that, one of the practices that comes from Tantra is worship of the lingam or the penis and worship of the yoni or the vagina or the well it's more than the vagina it's the whole thing it's the vulva it's the vagina it's the ovaries it's the uterus it's the cervix it's all the all the bits that make us um that make us juicy and so uh that practice which we hear a lot about in tantra comes from this reality of celebrating the sacred beauty that is available in in sex and the reality of creation it's an honor to us as humans and an honor to the devoted act of pleasure with a partner um it's an act of devotion and celebration to a partner's body and i think about you know folks like your your lover your musician who at 19, 20, 21, wherever he was at his life, just probably didn't have enough practice because that's the thing about all of this is practice, practice, practice. You don't just, it gets kind of awkward without a practice. It's like, oh, ice skating for the first time. Uh, but with the practice of it and developing that, you do end up having sex for hours because a big chunk of that time might just be dedicated to worshiping your partner's body. Um, and that is a practice that comes from Tantra, a very simple one, but so deeply spiritual and so like just deep and real and magical that we could do um, in our lives in a, on a regular basis with our partners or even with ourselves. Could you share what that might look like? Like what would a beginner practice or start maybe – integrating into the, whether it's their own self-pleasure practice or with a partner, what would some basic practices be? Yeah. So I like to tell folks just like get kind of Beyonce-esque with it. I think a lot of times we play ourselves real small and we don't want to be corny or cheesy. And so we don't want to light 200 candles. 
because we are worried what somebody might say or that it might be weird. And I think like, you know, I think about Sasha Fierce and how she's, you know, how when she steps, when Beyonce steps into that persona, she's not really worried about if she looks weird, she's got to move through the, the ritual of performance. And um, that's always my first thing. It's like, we make ourselves so small in sex um, that we, you know, we might light a candle or burn an incense, or maybe we pull out the lingerie for a special occasion, but I'm going to build an altar to myself or to my lover. And I want it to be like God-esque, you know, like I want it to be divine. We look at altars. I just returned from Thailand where I'm going into these temples that have been built and these altars that are extravagant and gold is everywhere. And there's like, there's such care and um, and just like this meticulous devotion that goes into it that there's no shame and like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this much for Buddha. <laughs> And I think we should, you know, like as a as a practice from the beginner standpoint, it's first just go big or go home. Create a space where worship will be, will build the energy that you want in your sexual space. So light the candles, be extra, find the fabrics that feel the yummiest on your skin. Um find the fragrances, the foods, make it an event where the the central focus point is the partner, the body part, but everything is here in honor of it. Like I'm bringing all of these things to the altar, my best pillows, my softest blanket, my most well lubricated lotioned body. Um, you know what I mean? Like I'm going to the Korean spa and getting exfoliated before this. I want to come in and feel so good to myself that the act of falling into devotion becomes easier with practice. And so that's my first thing It's just make it bigger than you think it's supposed to be because supposed to be is coming from somewhere else. It has nothing to do with you and your love life. And so whatever you think it's supposed to be, go bigger than that. Make it more dramatic, make it sexier, make it what you want it to what you want devotion to to feel like for you. And then you spend time. I um, When I'm looking into a lover's body, I'm staring at their genitals. I'm gazing into their genitals. I'll get very close and breathe into them. Take in the aromas. I want to use all of my five senses. I save taste for last because what well, we know, sometimes you get a little fired up once we put our mouth on genitals. <laughs> But starting in a space where you're really taking in and being present with the lingam or the yoni and allowing yourself to really see it for maybe the first time if you're a beginner. Like maybe you've never really noticed all of the different colors on your partner's genitals because you know the lights are dim or whatever. But now you have 200 candles <laughs> or or whatever your lighting situation is. You're you're this close and you're looking and you're able to take in the smells without being distracted or thinking about your own smells. You're not centering yourself in this moment. You're just elevating and venerating and centering them, their bodies, their genitals in this moment. Um, offering gratitude, uh, you know, saying songs of praise, which don't have to be literal songs, but, you know, compliments and talking about what you love about it. Those kind of things, just moving into this act of worship. And that can be five minutes. It can be 30 minutes. It can be an hour of just sitting and gazing, stroking, getting to feel like using all, literally all of your senses and, and allowing that, allowing yourself to connect to your partner in that way. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. That sounds amazing. I feel like one of the things that comes up in sex and sexual connections so often and the blockages to like a good sexual connection and a good sexual experience really is not... Um, feeling connected to the partner, having one partner just like 
not wanting to get into it, not feeling satisfied, not knowing what turns them on. And this a practice of devotion and I always say like set set the scene <laughs> like right but I think that your take uh, or the tantric take on that which is create a place of worship in your bedroom because that's what you're doing um, and and making the space conducive to that right so the minute you go into that space there's already that that energy flowing but actually worshiping your partner's body and then verbalizing, um, you know, verbalizing your great gratitude that you get to have this opportunity um, to be intimate with them and to touch them and to get that close and to taste, taste them. That's automatically going to t- like fix some of the problems that are there, right? How could someone not mm-hmm. feel in the mood or feel have their cups start to be filled when the person that they love is like worshiping them and thanking them and telling them what's perfect and beautiful and, you know, desirable about them. How often does that happen? That does not even happen. And it doesn't happen in typical, you know, your everyday sex, right? No, it's right, it's right. usually like let's get together, like you kiss a couple times, and and I'm talking about sort of heteronormative, you know, the conventional take on sex, and then pound away. No wonder people's bodies are shutting down and saying, I especially uh, vulva owners, uh, and saying I don't want this anymore. Why would you, you know? Yeah, and I think that like that's such a huge part of this to me is in my work with clients, like I'm working with, mo- most of my clients are women. Um, and a great number of them are coming to me at this point where they're not interested in sex with their partners in the way that they want to be or used to be. And, or their partners are coming with the same complaint, like they're not that into it anymore, what, what happened? And um, I like to tell, there's a, a story that when I went to, um, when I first moved to Costa Rica, I was having a conversation with the mechanic who was taking me home after I dropped my car off and he asked what I did. And I told him, you know, in my in my best Spanish uh, available sex coach is easier to explain. So I'm like, you know, I teach, it's my teach. And he laughed and laughed and he said, well, why would anybody want need that like who's hiring you for that and I said well let me ask you a question do you have any friends that are married he said well of course I do I said well do they do any of the husbands complain that their wives uh don't like to have sex he's like all of them and I'm like yeah do the wives do everything else that they really love to do and he just paused and he didn't say anything and we sat in silence for a few minutes but when he dropped me off he's like I need to get your phone number because I would like for to set up a meeting where you could like talk to me and some of the husbands because the reality is is that if there's something that I really enjoy doing I'm going to do it like that's called human (laughs) and uh when we get this rapid fire sex as our norm and I'm all about a conscious quickie I'm all about like oh let's you know I have spontaneous desire she's hot she's wet let's go right now that happens too um but that's not how it always happens, it's not going to always, be, and I'm 47, so that's uh, becoming less frequent, this like waking up with, you know, morning dew. And so I want more, I want more, you know, and I've wanted more for a long time, but I'm also talking to a lot of women in particular, and some men who want more, they want more connection. And uh, and it manifests differently in women than men, right? Women will oftentimes, and this is by no means like a binary, this is how it is, women or men, but women will oftentimes, you know, just kind of withdraw and find pleasure in other things. And men will withdraw and seek to conquer more bodies. They will go and um, try to get that fulfillment through uh, multiple sex partners and, um uh, sometimes even riskier sex. I worked in HIV and AIDS prevention for a long time and saw it under that umbrella as well. I'm just like constantly chasing something but not really knowing what that is. And I really believe it's it's that that 
loss of connection because it's such a fundamental human need. Connection is a human need. And we are able to access that through erotic intimacy. Uh, but that's not what we're doing. So this allows us to invite connected erotic intimacy into our lives. And maybe that's once a month. Maybe that's once, you know, like a quarter. Um, I have a lot of little practices we can do uh, throughout the time. It doesn't always have to be yoni and lingam worship. Sometimes it's eye gazing. Sometimes it's just breathing together. You know, sometimes it's just sitting with one hand on your partner's heart and just actually remembering that they have a heartbeat and you do too, right? And like just being present for their humanness. Um, and then sometimes it's getting tied up and exploring sensation play with uh, warm bird wheels and whips. Like it's all kind of things. <laughs> well, I like those options. <laughs> Like you really moved through them and I'm like, check, check. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I think that that's another piece is that people get bored. They do the same, they, you know, they do the same thing over and over again and don't realize the breadth of possibility. Even if you aren't as like a lot of people are like, I'm not kinky. Um, but there are just activities you can participate in that bring in like I think a little restraints pretty vanilla these days uh, but exploring yeah. the right a lot of things that used to be kinky are no longer they're they're everyday activities um, yeah but I love so you brought up the worship the worshiping each other's genitals um, and I love the focus on just seeing so many of us haven't even really like seen like truly you know the lights are off and we just get down there and do the thing we've been told to do but to like really mm -hmm. see um our genitals our partner's genitals I am going to assume that if you were to take a, a tantra practice for self-pleasure would be gazing at your own genitals which I think so many vulva owners and women need to do like absolutely and and worship it I hear constantly um, women talk about how gross they think their own genitals are. They see that. I don't want to look at that. It's weird. Yeah. I think it's a leftover remnant from junior high school. And there was a point in junior high school that I can remember where we started getting hormones and our vulvas started changing. Um, they go from these neat little kind of envelope looking packets to whatever they blossom to be. <laughs> and at this time, you're starting to crush on people because your hormones are there. You're also starting to stink, <laughs> right? So everybody's a little funky. And I, you, if you don't remember this, just stop by a junior high school for like 10 minutes. It stinks. They, I, I, I've taught sex ed and then they smell rancid as an adult. I'm like, we were living like this? Um, they and so you have kids that are telling you you stink, that are saying that the woman stinks, that the you know the smells that are coming up in in this explosion of hormones, um, is stinky, and so women are like, you're gonna sit there and smell me for ten and fifteen minutes? I don't think so. Like that doesn't even make me feel like I'm not gonna be sexy there, because I haven't gotten to know my own smell. Or you're going to stare at it? I have not even seen it, right? So how can I have you stare at it and feel comfortable when I've never looked at it for very long myself or at all? And so while this uh, gazing practice and worship practice sounds amazing to you and I, for many people, it's absolutely terrifying. The idea that someone might be just staring at us that long and... What are they looking at? And so instead of me just allowing myself to be worshipped, I'm just running through all these thoughts of like, I'm trying to clench my booty hole so you don't smell anything. I'm thinking about how, how ugly it is. Am I wet enough? Is it getting wet? Is it too wet? Is it all of these thoughts? Because we haven't spent time worshipping our own bodies and getting to know. So the, the self-gazing is critical. Um, you know, for us, 
uh, with, with vulvas, they're tucked away. We don't see them. So we have to go get a mirror. I remember the first time for me, I had squatted over a mirror. I had a, had a bad wax and a hair bump down there. And I was like, oh my God, I have caught something horrible. And I just remember shuttling over a mirror, like, um, like on all fours so that I could get a good look. And that was, you know, in my early 20s. And up until that point, I hadn't spent any time really looking at my vulva at all. And I had seen a lot of vulvas, though, on porn. And porn cast a type. And so I was, uh, I thought mine was ugly, too, because it didn't look like any of the ones I had seen on porn. Um, I'd also seen some vulvas in the club, because... The gay clubs a lot and strip clubs a lot, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but I just knew what mine mine didn't mine was meteor. And I was thinking like the oh, I if someone had told me let someone gaze in it back then, I would have died on the spot. It took me spending time to really love on and worship my own body and my self-worship practice when I'm coaching. I, I coach folks to do I have a daily worship practice of self. Uh, my grandmother prayed every morning before she came downstairs. And I don't understand why we can't do that to ourselves, even if it's five or 10 minutes, just to spend time smelling, tasting, um, touching, moisturizing, you know, just really caring for our bodies, for our vulvas, for our vaginas. Like, can we take care of ourselves? Because we don't, it's tucked away. Otherwise, we'll just kind of, It'll just be down there. And so, yeah, creating creating ritual around that is really important. And taking a look at it is really important. Um, and, you know, for for those with penises, it's the same, same science applies because just because you see the top of it doesn't mean you know what's going on underneath. Doesn't mean you've seen your own scrotum or behind your scrotum your perineum, all the parts you may not feel comfortable having someone touch, like touch them yourself. See what, what happens when you, when you allow yourself to explore, because that's a part of the process is learning to become more comfortable with your own body. I love that. I love the idea of a daily self-worship that includes, you know, sight, scent, touch. You know, I also think women should and and men people with penises should incorporate tasting into this practice like you should know what you taste like there's so much fear around that fear or in some cases like an uh expectation that someone else is going to be willing to taste you when you're not willing to taste yourself right right and i think just really knowing your body also all of that stuff that you learn especially on a daily basis I definitely haven't done that but it gives you so much information on your own health and well-being you'll know when something's off you're you'll know and this is so important you know I, I'm I just turned 50 for for women as we age like really knowing where our health is at is super important mm -hmm. When the skin is changing yeah. and the scent and taste are changing, like maybe you need to like check into your whole health. Like when I look at the Tibetan um, lineage of, of Tantra, it's a lot of embodiment, right? It's a lot of about like listening to your body. And our body is talking to us in a lot of ways. Um, our nervous system is processing and communicating, impacting our heart. Our, our blood flow, our hormonal regulation, our chemical responses, that is showing up in your yoni. That is showing up in your semen. And so like I often joke because if I get real stressed out, my right armpit is much more potent. Like it's like, oh, that's a stress scent. That's not like regular. I was hot today. Uh, and that's because stress actually creates a different chemical response in the body and you will smell that and you will taste it. It's not to say it will be foul, but it will be very different. And so it's good to know where you are in the day before you go out and expose yourself to everybody else. Um, how much can you even take on from the world might be something that 
you can find out through some early morning breath work and solo pleasure before you go out into the world. You already, you've kind of taken a temperature reading of where you are and who you are on that day. What are your stress levels like? Is this, are you in your sweet phase? Are you ovulating? Um, because these are different, right? These are different areas. If I'm ovulating, that's very different than when I'm about to uh, cleanse my uterus. Like these are different energies <laughs> and they're different smells. They're different tastes. Um, if my diet's not right, which will impact my, my desire, I will know that. Uh, my pH can be off. I can know that uh, you should never let, you know, these things catch you off guard. And so, yeah, tasting is huge uh, in getting to know your wellness and you have an access point that's so easily, it's just within arm's reach. Uh, I want to move on to breath work as part of your own sensual, sexual kind of self practice. I know it's a big part of Tantra. I don't, know a lot about it. I know that only in the last, I'm going to say handful of months, I've started to uh, use my own breath work to change the kind of orgasms I have and to direct my like, I, <clears throat> at the beginning of this year was really going through heavy grief mm -hmm. and I could move grief out of my body while orgasming with the breath, like lock in the grief as I was orgasming and kind of move it out of my body, which was really intense. Something I'm so glad I'm doing less of. But recently I've also been able to use breath work to sort of change the intensity and type of orgasm that I have. I would love for you to explain a little bit. I And I'm like free, free ball in it, like no knowledge, just doing, right? Because I've read a little uh -huh. bit here and there. So what I would love for you to do is speak some, like, what am I doing? I want to tell you, first of all, this knowledge is innate. You, you know what you're doing because it's as natural as you doing it. It's just you're looking for the backup. But we have a lot of this information that's already in our body and we know we could play around with it. It's like dribbling our ball or dribbling breath. We're getting to know what it's like to handle our breath. And, um, you know, I, for many of us, when we first witnessed sex in on TV in whatever form, whether that was on some soap opera or in a, you know, niche porn, wherever in all the levels in between, that it, the breath, especially, you know, it gets really breathy, right? And you get that oh, kind of happening in Hollywood with breath. And that is how I thought I was supposed to breathe when I had sex. It was, I started having sex young and I, I did that same thing. Well, it turns out that that's actually the same breath that my body is familiar with when it is in panic. That is the breath of uh, flight or fight. That is, uh, it's not a very deep, thorough breath, right? And so, yeah, I could have that breath. And I'm not to say that it might not, I might not also experience pleasure in that breath. But by having a breath practice and in semantics, you say you are what you practice, right? So having a breath practice that is a part of who I am as a regular human being, just like noticing my breath, seeing where it's at. I like to just see how much access to my lungs I have at a particular moment or on a particular day. Seeing if I can move breath down and around, seeing what happens if I allow my abdomen to fully get out of the way for my diaphragm to make as much space as possible for my lungs. Playing around with the muscles in my body while I breathe outside of sex, just as a practice. It doesn't have to be anything that takes hours out of your day. You can be like, I'm going to sit for five minutes and focus on nothing but breath. And that will probably, what I, what I find is most people that do that regularly for five minutes fall in love with it. And as I said earlier, you do, a, you do the things you love a lot and then they just find themselves easily drifting off into 15 to 20 minutes of it, which makes it so much more natural when you are having sex because now you're not trying to do breath work. You're doing this thing that you always do when you're relaxing, when you're paying attention to your body. And a breath does a couple of things. One, it gives me something to bring my awareness inward. 
which um, and it's, I'm sure there's at least one listener here who is having sex and brain is over there and over there and going through the list of things that they didn't get to and wondering how much time this is going to take if they got to get back to the thing they're supposed to get to. The kids are coming in, yada, yada, yada. Well, if I'm in all of those spaces and I'm not in my body, and so I'm not actually accessing my pleasure fully. So at the very minimum, breath work is going to bring us into our bodies so that we can actually feel good. So that we actually get the pleasure, like be in the experience of what is pleasurable. But also, and also, you get this opportunity to kind of play with it and notice like, oh, if I breathe like this, then maybe my orgasm is like a little bit deeper or it expands out or it lasts longer. And there's not one formula for every one because your breath, your body's relationship to breath and your body's relationship to pleasure are going to be based on what has shaped you in your life. And what has gotten you to this point. But to just not have any breath practice, it, you're missing out on some of the joy and some of the pleasure, a lot of it really, that's accessible to you at, at such a simple level because breath is what you're already doing. You're already breathing. You've already got that down. So now just practice some other ways to breathe so that when you're in these moments of a deep, deeply erotic uh, bliss that you have other alternatives of breath other than the oh shit breath, other than the, um, the is everything okay breath, you actually are able to go into the I'm relaxed fully, I'm open and present breath. And that is where that orgasm shifts. The first time I really experienced it, I wasn't thinking about it, but the sounds I started making, I was probably one of the first times I experienced multiple orgasms with somebody else. And I was so like recognizing I was having this opportunity and like, was like, okay, and, and now let's get into the body. <laughs> let's, let's, mm -hmm. you know, um, and the sounds that I made in that experience, I, I was like, it sounded a little bit like I was giving birth. It was very primal. That breath yeah. was very, very primal. Not at all. You've never heard it in porn. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. And I even had a moment of like, this sounds really weird. And I'm like, I do not care. And I have noticed that the more that I play with breath as I, because I have a, an extensive self-pleasure practice, but as I orgasm, the more that I can actually, then I'm connecting breath with pleasure. So even when I'm not touching myself, I can use breath to start to build the sexual excitement and satisfaction just through mm. breath because I'm creating kind of those connections. My brain is connecting them, which is nice. So. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Can you talk a little bit, bit about the lingam massage? I've actually had listeners reach out and ask me about the lingam, lingam massage and the yoni massage, uh, what these practices mm -hmm. are. Yeah, so I mean, at the basic level, it is it is a massage um, for the genitals, and I want to say a couple of things about this because there's a lot of wild. It's the wild, wild west out there in, in the world of lingam and yoni massage. The idea is not that when I'm offering a massage, um, and I've been teaching lingam and yoni massage for about fifteen years. The idea is not that I'm offering this touch so that you can ejaculate or um, have an orgasm or squirt or any of these things that you may see marketed. And I'm not taking away from folks that are doing that as a part of their practice. I'm just saying that it's not the goal of a lingam or a yoni massage. It happens sometimes, oftentimes it can happen. The the reality is, is too often our genitals are for someone else. They are, we get some of the parts of it, but like if I, you know, for someone with a penis, they're trying to get it in and make sure that you feel it and go as deep as possible and be it big enough and be hard enough. 
And for those of us with vulvas, we're trying to make sure it's wet enough and tight enough and we're kegling ourselves to death. And like all of this is happening, not for our own pleasure, but for the pleasure of someone else. Just very similar to the way it is when we come to looking at our own genitals. We actually don't have oftentimes a deep relationship with felt sense in our genitals, with what it feels like to have them touched, what um, the sides of the shaft feel like, what the front feels like comparatively to the back. Um, we don't have a, a frame of reference because Linda I and mean, Yoni was not just illegal <laughs> in most parts of the country. And it's not something that we're talking about. And so for folks who are trying to experience more pleasure, more genital pleasure, and it's a really good place to start in that there's uh, ways to map pleasure through uh, gentle manipulation of the uh, vulva, of the vaginal canal, of the penis. And so it's a beautiful way to invite the person into touch without having them have to do anything. It doesn't matter if you ejaculate. So you don't have to try to be like, oh, I'm not going to come yet, right? Which is uh, taking away from your ability to feel pleasure that, that you've come into your head about not coming. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to worry about like how long this is going to go or is this going to be painful? Like all of these things that get in the way of you actually experiencing your body, those things move out of the way when we have a practice that allows a practitioner or a lover to come in and offer touch in um, a beautiful, loving, sensual, and therapeutic way to the whole genital area, the insides of the thighs, the top of the, the mons pubis, the, the shaft, the head, the balls, all of this. The, um, the perineum, you know, really feeling into the labia, like having women ha notice where the clitoris actually sits in relation to the labia. It's pretty big and people get a chance to feel that behind the skin when someone is offering a yoni massage. They get to feel the engorgement. They get to feel the different phases and just be present for that instead of also trying to be present for a lover which is really, really powerful. And one of my favorite practices to teach, to offer, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just magical. And it, I can't speak enough about it. If you get a chance, I teach workshops all over. And there's other folks, tons of folks up in the Pacific Northwest for sure, but people all over the country that, that teach um, and, and offer how to uh, give a massage, how to have the confidence in your hands to offer that to someone else. And so, yeah, it's just a really beautiful practice and it's not rooted in performance like so much of our sex is. Oh, oh, and so you're saying one of the main benefits is that you learn your own pleasure where it's mm -hmm. taking place you connect more with your own body and your own pleasure. Are there other benefits to these types of massages? Yeah, there's a lot of trauma that we experience in our genitals. Most penises in the West have been cut as an infant. They have a circumcision scar that actually impacts their ability to feel pleasure. That is trauma to the body. And so um, it offers an opportunity to do some healing around that as well. Uh, feeling safe in the body for folks who have experienced sexual trauma of any type doesn't necessarily have to be as violent as rape, but that also included. It just gives you a chance to actually feel yourself. And um, and so there's there's healing in that and recognizing that I'm human, desire is human, pleasure is human. I can feel this. I don't have to do anything to feel this. I am worthy. It is in my body. This is who I am. That builds something in the body 
that is healing. Um, it's also just fun <laughs> and fun and joy are like human requirements. So I also like to like, well, we could wax poetic and be all philosophical, but the reality is, is it feels good. And when I feel good, my body releases all kinds of other chemicals. Sure, I can go and buy some chemicals. I could have my doctor prescribe them for me. But a lot of them, my body creates just fine on its own. And pleasurable touch is easy way to access some of, bodies, some of my body's natural um, chemical neurotransmitters, the, uh, all of that, all the good stuff that make me balanced as a human being. Um, and so, yeah, spreading joy is a good reason to get a yoni massage or give one. Can you use Tantra practices, even on your own, to try to manifest the things that you want in your mm -hmm. life? I really believe one of the most powerful practices in Tantra in general to me has been the practice of somatic descent, which I learned from Reggie Ray. Um, and you can Google Reginald, Dr. Reginald Ray, uh, and somatic descent, his practices are actually free online. You can take classes with him, I've studied through his programs, but the somatic descent is a practice of dropping deeply into your body through a meditation so that your body can tell you what it needs and wants. It, very short, succinct wrapping up of what what, it, what the practice is. I do not believe we manifest well when we don't know what we want. I do not believe that it is easy to manifest things that don't belong to us. And in a capitalistic consumer-driven society, manifesting is becoming harder and harder because we are striving for things that won't serve us, um, that won't offer the fulfillment that we want and need. And so Tantra and the practice of somatic descent, um, which is through Vajrayana Tantra, Tibetan Tantra, allows you to develop a deep relationship with self, with the body, in so much that you really know what you want and then you actually feel that feeling again when you're near it, which is mm -hmm. what I believe we're doing when we're manifesting. I believe that like, if I know what the feeling is when I am fully immersed in the understanding of what I want, that when I'm near it, I'm drawn to it and it's drawn to me. Everything else I got to work hard for. And I am giving up on working hard. You and me alike. Because what I have realized is if I like tune into the energy around me, what I often do is I'll wake up one day and I'll be like, here are my goals today. And this is how I'm going to like push my whatever businesses forward, make more money. And I wake up and everything I push on like fails. And so I push harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. pretty soon I'm in this like state of being where I'm like, everything's failing. I suck. I can't do this. And what I've realized now is like I tune into my day, I feel out what's going on, and maybe I try something, you know, something on my my large to-do list. And the minute it starts to crumble, I'm like, that's not what today is about. <laughs> so today, yeah, I'm gonna like change my mode into something like that's more about feeling good good or resting or taking what I already have and really being grateful and maybe fortifying it I really tuning in instead of I because I think in western culture when it comes to sex when it comes to finding relationships when it, when it comes to uh, building life it's like kill yourself to do it work 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 and acquire and if you mm -hmm. haven't acquired yet, work more until you're dead. And then you've never gotten to really like enjoy life, right? Right. And back to yeah. what you said about manifesting. I like to frame it as using the power of the pussy to manifest the life I want. Mm -hmm. um, and what I think I've realized and what I love about sort of s s summarizing this episode on manifestation using Tantra 
is that a lot of the love and the sex and the relationships I've manifested in my life haven't come from a place of actually knowing what I really wanted. And I didn't even know how to know what I really wanted, right? But Mm -hmm. as I've been sinking into sort of this uh, self-pleasure practice, I've started to like, and it's, I feel it in my low, in my belly, in my, um, in my pussy area. And then it kind of comes up to my heart and I'm starting to be able to see clearly, more clearly what I want. Um, But I love that you have given me that extra insight to like, okay, now I have this feeling what happens with it and that when I encounter it out in the, in the world, I'm going to, if I'm staying tuned in, I'm going to feel it. Yeah. My my manifestation procedure is just follow your pleasure. If, if I know what is feeling pleasurable to me and I'm leaning towards that, I am always moving towards my success. That's been uh, tried and tested for me. And when I'm, uneasy or feeling a feeling that is displeasurable to me what I've determined is not pleasurable to me and I go anyway I'm always in some like in some shit I'm always like this is not what I wanted this is not and if I just listened and pay attention to the sensations the feelings the information that my body was already giving me then I wouldn't have went there and I would have been on a different path Sometimes you got to learn the lesson multiple times and I have. And so I end up there, but um, you know, that's, that's my, I, I know what it is when I'm there. I like didn't follow the pleasure. So we're at that point where it's time to sum things up for my listeners. If I had a listener here I was like, all right, I, I've taken in this podcast. I want to start integrating some practices today, tomorrow, and then learn more and go deeper down the road. What is the little kind of package, go package, go bag, if you will, of Tantra learnings, maybe practices they could just dip their toe in starting right away? My biggest thing is, and I give this to all of my clients when they first started work, start working with me, is to do 30 days of self-pleasure first thing in the morning, um, whether that's five minutes or an hour, give yourself the range um, of space. When you, when you have an hour, take it. When you have five minutes, take it. But spend a little bit of time just loving on your own body every day for 30 days and see what happens. Just pay attention. Pay attention to what you're noticing, to what, to the colors in the world, because they might be a little different, but just like literally just pay attention. See what comes alive for you in that. What information is there? Journal through it. um, And stay consistent. Offer yourself a few minutes a day before you give yourself up to the world. Be selfish first thing in the morning as a tantric ritual. And allow yourself to come into the world that way every day. Start there. And it doesn't matter if you have a partner. This is not just for I am married. I have someone in my bed every night, just about, um, at least one person. And so it doesn't matter if you're partnered or not. This is for you. This is your practice. So give yourself that as a as a reality and see what happens from there. Um, see how that opens up and expands. Because the reality is, is that this, there is no prescription for one individual except for what comes from within you. And so if you can actually start experiencing your own self at pleasure, um, if you can start paying attention to your own self, creating space, loving on, worshiping your own self, that will open you up into a world of embodied, fulfilled sex um, just from that practice alone. And so do 30 days with no break, and see what happens. That's always my first, no, I don't, no matter the gender, no matter the gender arrangement, um, th- those of you with penises, I'm not talking about, you know, so and jacking off. I'm talking about touching and feeling, allow yourself to become erect and then fizzle back out. Do you, this is not like, how many times can I nut in a month? I just want to be clear because sometimes people hear that and they run in the opposite direction. Um, 
And it's also not like, what's my most powerful vibrator, um, vulva folks? Like, I also want to just clarify that. Like, yes, the vibrator is great. I have an assortment. And so sometimes just like actually touching and rubbing on yourself with your hands, just get into your own body for, for 30 days. See what happens. Notice what your breath is doing. Um, notice what else there is to notice. Be curious, be playful, be light, and and see how your perspective on sex and sexuality changes just from that little basic practice. From there, we can build up. Support it 100%. Uh, can you tell everybody where they can find you and learn more about you? Yeah. Yeah, so you can see me on, if you haven't seen um, Netflix's Sex, Love, and Goop, you can see me on episode three. Uh, you can also find me anywhere on at ATL Tantra. So atltantra.com.org, um, uh, at ATL Tantra on social media, and, um, and then at your local sex conferences and tantra festivals. Look for me there, too. Thank you so much for joining me. For my listeners, if you are just a listener, if you want to, you can always email me your questions at Annette at TalkSexWithAnnette.com. If you want to head over to my YouTube channel at Annette Benedetti and find this video, watch it because you want to see our beautiful faces. But if you drop a comment into the comment section below the video, then I can keep your questions organized. I can reach out to Amina to answer anything that she can answer um, and get you sort of the knowledge and information you want as, as soon as, as possible. That's all I'm going to promise. But you can always email me. Uh, you know how to get a hold of me. Scroll down, subscribe to my newsletter because I will be sending all of this information to you as well. I also have a speak pipe. You can send me a voice message if that is easier for you. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, Amina. I thank feel honored and I feel like I have a lot of takeaways that I'm going to be integrating into my own life. So I very much appreciate you. So until next time, listeners, I will see you in the locker room. Cheers.